Um, I just love singing with you and love being here. And I want to share with you that we, um, next Sunday, we're going to observe the Lord's Supper together. And so be preparing your heart this week uh, for that. It's always a very, very special time. And uh, I hope uh, that 2024 has gotten off to a wonderful start with you. We, for two weeks, looked at this theme, really the last Sunday in uh, of, of 2023. We started it on that New Year's Eve. Um, look up. And we said that sometimes we have an outlook, right? You know, we have a 2024 outlook, and that's what we hear. Uh, it's in the markets. It's in the job uh, place. It's in uh, just every. It's an outlook. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with being uh, prepared and plan- planning. Uh, but we said we don't want to just have an outlook. We want to have an uplook. And so for two weeks, we, uh, that was our theme. <clears throat> well, today, um, we're going to... Um, Uh, have a uh, a really start a series for several weeks that I was intending to do last year, and God sort of changed uh, our plans last year with uh, the sermon schedule. Uh, But uh, today we're going to start a series that will last about six weeks, and uh, uh, it's it's about the family. Now, um, we want to have a spirit-filled family, and the Bible tells us a little bit about that, and uh, it's it's transformed the spirit-filled family. You know, God, uh, it was a good day in my life when I realized that God offers us a transformation. Uh, I was actually, um, you know, I I think most of you know my testimony. I was saved at a young age, grew up in a Christian home. And um, it took me a long time to realize that, that really, even though I got saved at a young age, uh, my life was totally transformed, and so I, I, I freely tell people, the Word of God changed my life, and uh, the Word of God transformed my life, and God's grace transformed my life, uh, and uh, I, I, that's the testimony of every Christian, certainly, and so uh, as we think about that theme, um, God wants to transform our relationships, and certainly a family of grace and a family of God and a uh, a Christian family is a family that God says, I want to transform you. Now, don't let the theme of the fact that we're looking at family scare you if you go like, well, I'm not even married, you know, or my kids are grown and they're out of my home, um, which is Melinda's in my case. Uh, but at the same time, we have grandkids. And, and at the same time, um, you know, it, t- to me, uh, one of the things that um, God used in my life when Melinda and I uh, were uh, first married, and then we began, uh, you know, we had a child, and, and then a second one, uh, was um, people that were in my life that had the experience of parenting, uh, that would, were able to speak into our lives and to help us. And so I think these principles are incredibly important. And like Pastor Jeffrey said, um, we're going to get something uh, out of this. It's not just don't tune out because you say, well, my kids are older, or my, you know, I don't have any kids. Because the fact that God might want to use you in the life of someone that has children, maybe you have grown children that have children, or uh, you're also going to find that uh, there are some things that we're going to talk about these next few weeks that are going to affect our relationship with God. And so as we um, think along those lines today, uh, the the title of uh, the series, of course, is Transform the Spirit-Filled Family, but Today's message is simply this, the heart, the heart. And, and I want to ask you to open your Bibles to Deuteronomy chapter 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, all in, around our community, we often will go into a home and, and uh, there is something on the door post, uh, and that door post, uh, it's a little mezuzah, and inside that there is a um, little compartment and there's a scripture uh, in that. Well, if it's, if it's um, uh, authentic, then there's scripture inside that. And the scripture that's inside that is our text today from Deuteronomy chapter 6. And what a great remembrance of, um, what, a great remembrance of, of what um, we are supposed to understand when we go into our home or when we, um, you know, when we um, are, are interacting, when we go into our home, when we leave our home. So Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now, uh, as you open your uh, Bible there or turn on your uh, phone or find it wherever you're going to find it, um, God designs all things for his glory and for the joy of his people. 
So I want to I want to just build a platform for five minutes uh, concerning what we're going to talk about today. All right. So uh, it was um, an 18th century preacher, Jonathan Edwards, who said this, and I love this quote. Listen to it. God, in seeking his glory, seeks the good of his creatures uh, because the emanation of his glory implies the happiness of his creatures. So when God is glorified, uh, in other words, then this leads to a joy in our life because uh, if our life is glorifying God, then it's serving its purpose. And when we're serving God's eternal purposes, there brings a joy and a satisfaction into our life. Uh, the Westminster Shorter Catechism says this, man's chief uh, end, man's chief end or purpose, man's chief end is to glorify God and to, and to enjoy him forever. And so uh, the, the purpose of my life, the purpose of your life is to glorify God. Uh, and, uh, and, and as we do that, we have a relationship that uh, is, is designed to enjoy God forever. That's because he gives us eternal life if we've put, placed our faith in him. But the, the Bible also talks so much about God's glory. Uh, Revelation chapter 4, verse 11 says, Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things. Yes, Jesus Christ has created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. For his pleasure, for his glory. Colossians 1.16 is a very similar theme to that. It says, for by him were all things created that are in heaven. This is speaking of Jesus. All things are created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things are created by him and for him. Uh, <clears throat> and so this world and all that's in it, all of his creation, the original design, the original purpose was for God's glory. That includes you. That includes me. That includes our children. And so um, I, uh, I, uh, let's, let's continue with that theme about God's glory. I, I looked up a, a statement that was made. There's a, a Christian university that's been in the news uh, recently at the end of 2023. Um, but Grand Canyon University they put out a statement, I don't know how long ago, it's probably been there for years, it's on their website, on the statement of human flourishing. Because when we talk about God's glory, uh, he put us here and he wants us to flourish. More on that in just a moment. But here's their statement. As creatures made in the image of God, flourishing in the most profound sense entails communion with God the Father through faith in Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit. As individuals and communities pursue the purposes Jesus commends, it becomes possible to experience the blessing of God and the transformation he offers in Christ. And so there's something that I like to refer to, and it certainly isn't uh, original with me, but I've, I, I hear a lot of theologians talk about this and Bible believers and students of the Bible talk about creation order. I think it's very important that we understand that term, that we use it, that we're familiar with it, creation, order. In other words, when God's design is followed, man flourishes. And, and that's really a battle that we're seeing in our culture today, creation, order. It has to do with human sexuality. Uh, it has to do with uh, human gender. It has to do with <clears throat> uh, the home. It has to do with society at large, um, when God's design is followed, man flourishes. Now, I'm not talking about, a little caveat here, I'm not talking about uh, financially um, when, when I talk about flourishing. I'm talking about, and I believe God takes care of his children, but I don't think he owes us, and I don't think there's any promises in the Bible that say, if you do this, you're going to be wealthy. No, I think we can get into materialism, which uh, a lot of Christians have the misconcept concept um, that if you are not financially successful or you're doing something wrong because God intends you to have all the issues and all the dreams and all the desires of your heart. Can I just say this as we start out on this little journey? Um, this, this world, this purpose isn't about you and it's not about me. It's about him. And, and so he directs in the affairs of man. And, and I can't, and we'll never know this side of heaven, uh, why, does, uh, wh why is, does this happen in someone's life, or why does that happen in someone's life, why didn't that happen in my life, or why did that happen in my life and not in their life? 
Um, that's not something that we consume ourselves with or consu- let our thoughts be consumed by. The fact is, though, God uh, promises and desires for each one of us human flourishing. And I love that term. He wants us to flourish. And, and so uh, God did intend for his people to, influr- uh, to, to flourish. And he offers us um, peace. Uh, that passes understanding. I I was talking to Melinda. She's with her mother um, and her her mom had knee surgery, replacement surgery back in November. Then she had uh, uh, this past week, knee uh, surgery on her other knee. And Melinda's spending a couple weeks there helping her. And I was talking to Melinda on the phone the other day. And I said, Melinda, my heart this morning is just filled with and grateful for God's provision. And I said, I'm not talking about anything monetarily, you know. I, I, I paid some bills, and I, and I just thought for a minute, well, I'm glad I could pay those bills, you know. And I was thankful for God's provision. And, and that was the emanation. That, that was the start of it. And then I thought, but that's not the greatest thing God did for me to be able to pay my bills in January. You know, it was, it was this. I said, Melinda, the peace that I know in my heart that comes from God is the most incredible provision that he could ever, ever offer. God offers us human flourishing, and that's his design for every one of us, and it's a beautiful design. And so uh, having, uh, ha- having said that, let's, let's focus our attention and start to bring it about back, back to Deuteronomy chapter 6 with that as the foundation there, those thoughts, uh, to, to the book of Genesis chapter 1. Genesis, God uh, re- reiterates it, or, or it's really the first time that we see his purpose, uh, for mankind in, in, in flourishing. And so um, I, I would say this, if we genuinely love God and we love people, we want to see them flourish. Now, now here's what I, I want to say as I start a series on the family. Only God, God, God sets the stage for, um, for flourishing, right? It, it's God. So um, and, and that's because he created us and created this universe. So he set out the purpose. So um, we have a toaster in our kitchen at home. Um, the toaster was designed to toast bread. So I can take, uh, you know, if I, if I get some ice cream out of, the refriger- out of the freezer and it's really hard, I can put the ice cream in there to thaw it out. It's not going to work real well because that's not the purpose of a toaster, so God designed us and he designed the family and he said, now here's the purpose. And if you use it this way, it's really going to benefit you and you're going to flourish. So I have to say at the beginning here, it's God that designed the family. He's the one who defined it. He designed it. And so therefore, uh, uh, it, it, for, in order for a family to flourish, we have to consult God and we have to we have to be on his side, as we talked about uh, last week. So he says in Genesis 1, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. And uh, I don't mean this as a political statement, but, but uh, often statements that we make and beliefs that we have have political connotations, right? So, so I heard our president, I heard President Biden uh, a few months ago now, uh, it was in the fall, and he um, and, and they were celebrating transgenderism. Now, nothing that I say, I think, I think we have a responsibility to speak the truth in love. And so I trust that anything that we say and anything that I say today uh, would be uh, emanate from a heart of love. We are to speak the truth in love, but we are also to speak the truth. <laughs> you know, we can't just deny it and go like, well, culture doesn't really believe that, so let's just ignore that. No, we, we speak the truth we're commanded to, and we speak it in love. And, and so uh, when President Biden was talking about, they, they had a celebration of transgenderism, and he said, listen, uh, God accepts everybody because uh, we are all created in his image. Now, I totally agree with that at that point, that we can all find acceptance in Christ. But when we say, um, it, when, when you can find acceptance in Christ, that means that God will accept your lifestyle and anything that we choose to do, then I have to stop there and say that's absolutely not what the Bible teaches. And so um, our president stopped when he said, yes, you're all created in God's image as he was addressing transgenders. And, And by the way, my heart goes out to anybody who's not flourishing. 
Uh, I, I see God's design. I'm 59. The older I get, the more I see God's design is awesome, amazing. The peace that I, that I understand and that I feel, um, I, I want it for every one of my neighbors. I want it for people I come in contact with. There's no ill will. We don't, uh, we don't have uh, animosity toward anyone who's not flourishing. We, we desire that for him. Every Christian ought to have that as their heart. And, 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 and so he said, yeah, God, you, you're created in God's image. Well, the fact is, um, we're created in his image, but it doesn't mean that everything we do, God sanctions. And so he stopped. He didn't, he didn't continue the verse. Because here's what the verse says. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he him. And I found it very ironic that the verse that he used to prove that, see, it's okay to have problems with your gender and to change your gender is a verse that's exactly intended for the exact opposite, to say, listen, I want you to flourish. And so, you know, one of God's beautiful things about flourishing is that he created different genders. That's awesome. I mean, it's part of God's flourishing. He created the family and said, you're going to come together in your love, and guess what's going to happen? A a natural outflow of that family and many families is, I'm going to give you children. It's flourishing. It's, it's incredible God's design and his plan. But you step outside of his plan, and he doesn't, des- we, we don't, he doesn't know us flourishing. Just like if I put ice cream in my toaster, it's not really going to go well. And the manufacturer is going to go, you know, I take it back to them and go, hey, it doesn't work anymore. And they said, well, you know, what would you put in ice cream? He go like, well, it wasn't, that's not, no, you don't have a warranty. It's not intended for that use. And so what we want to have in our life is is human flourishing as God intended for it. And so uh, it says God that in Genesis 1, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. And so he said, be fruitful, and he said, multiply. So to be fruitful means to be productive. It means uh, to increase, to bring about beauty, to serve God's purpose. Um, God, I, I read one commentary, and I loved it, so I'm going to read it to you almost verbatim. God could have created everything imaginable and filled the earth with himself, but he chose to create humanity to work alongside him to actualize the universe, uh, universe's potential to participate in God's own work. So he put us here, and he said, now, uh, have dominion over the earth and, and produce and, uh, and work uh, and enjoy. I'm giving you a responsibility. You're going to be a part of my work. Uh, and, and so he said, be fruitful. Through our work, God brings forth food and drink, products and services, knowledge and beauty, organizations and communities, growth and health and praise and glory to himself. I love the way he put that. And so God said, be fruitful. And then he said, multiply. And of course, multiply uh, talks about populating the earth. In, in this, I don't know if you, you, you study uh, societies and you, and you listen to the news or, or um, uh, you, you know, economists, but we are going through world, almost worldwide uh, a problem now. Uh, for decades, um, sociologists and pe- people were saying, listen, we got a problem. There's too many people. We're going to overpopulate the earth and there's going to be too many people and there's not going to be enough food and it's going to be a problem. Stop having kids. Stop having kids. And it got to the point, and maybe even still is today, when you have a large family, people sort of look down on you. Like, I mean, the prince, uh, you, you know, the, 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 uh, the, uh, one of the uh, uh, English princes said, we're not going to, we're only going to, we're going to be responsible. We're going to only have two kids. You know, that's, we, to have more would be irresponsible. Uh, so society's bought into that. There's only one problem. God said, multiply. So you know what we're finding? We are finding, sociologists will tell you, and economists will tell you, we're headed for a problem because we don't have, get it, enough kids. We don't have enough kids. You, and I'm telling you, it's, a, it's here in America. Uh, South Korea, it's, their, their problem is almost irreversible. Japan's having the same problem. Uh, the Western world, uh, the uh, Western cultures are having problems because we don't have enough kids. Well, listen. All we had to do is go back to the beginning of creation when God said, be fruitful and multiply and say, we trust him with that. He knows exactly what to do. So as I talk about the family, what I want to say is that God designed the family. God invented or he created the family. And he said, now here's what a family is and here's how a family can flourish. And so who are we to say, well, God, we're going to change your definition and we're going to try to flourish outside of your plan. 
It just really doesn't work. And so be fruitful and multiply. Now, um, in Deuteronomy chapter 6, we're going to get to the text, but let me give you just a brief background. Deuteronomy is uh, an interesting book. You, you, we remember that when Israel came out of Egypt, remember after the Passover, and Moses leads them out of Egypt, soon they find themselves at Mount Sinai. Now, now you probably remember the story. Uh, Moses, uh, g- God wants to give them the law, so Moses goes up. Uh, nobody really knows. He's up there for, you know, over a month, and the people start going like, what happened to him? I think he's dead. Let's, now what are we going to do? We don't have a leader. You, you know, they got into the temptation, and they started worship. They formed a cow, a calf, and they, they started worshiping it. But Moses was getting the law from God. This was the first time that the law was given. So now they've, they've uh, been 40 years just going, all, not quite in circles, but just waiting for a generation to pass away. God in his graciousness didn't say, you know what, you didn't trust me. I'm going to get rid of you now, and then I'm going to take the others in. He just waited, and he worked, and he, wait, they, he waited, and he worked. Now it's time for Israel to go into the promised land. They're on the east side of the Jordan River, and they're getting ready to go into the promised land. Uh, just across the Jordan is Jericho. We talked about that a couple of weeks ago. And so as they're camped there on the east side of Jordan, getting ready to go across the Jordan River or through the Jordan River when God drops parts it and dries it up, he says, okay, Moses, I want you to gather the people, and I want you to give them the law. It's been 40 years since he gave them the law. And so there's, let's call this a refresher course. (laughs) You know, God goes like, now you're getting ready to go in. I want you to remember, uh, I want to set this as a memorial. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to remind you of the law. And so we have Deuteronomy. Uh, That, you you know, we we named that book Deuteronomy because the the, the Latin phrase or the root du, D-E-U, means to, like deuce is two, so do uh, two, and then Deuteronomy, nom, N-O-M, is law, nomenclature. And so this is the second law, or the second giving of the law. It's the book of Deuteronomy. All it is is God going like, hey, it was 40 years, you're getting ready to go in now, and so I want to remind you of my law. I want to remind you of my covenant. So they're, they're anticipating this. They're getting ready finally to go in. And um, the, the people that went in are, uh, it's, it's not the previous generation. Uh, the parents have died off in the wilderness. It's been 40 years. And, and so part of what God does is he says, I'm going to give you my law, and I'm going to give a challenge to every parent here. Isn't that interesting? Uh, their parents are gone, and they didn't trust God. And they were missing something in that generation in their trust of God. And so he says, listen, here's the second law. And I'm going to, toward the beginning of this, I want to let parents know something from my heart. And that's what we're going to read today. So look at Deuteronomy chapter 6, beginning in verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. And these words, which I command thee this day, shall be in thine heart. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house and when thou walkest by the way and when thou liest down and when thou risest up. risest up, And thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. And thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and upon thy gates." And so here's that section as he's given the second law that he says, now listen, uh, your parents sort of made some mistakes. And by the way, there's no perfect parent. I mean, and every parent has made mistakes and, and we make a, we've made a lot of them. But God still in his graciousness says, now listen, here's what I want to teach. I want you to teach your children. So let's have a word of prayer and then we'll quickly get uh, into this. Father, thank you for the privilege of being here. Thank you for our church family. Thank you for the faith they exhibit. Thank you for the desire to grow. Teach us today from your word and uh, help, help every one of us to get something from this that would help us in our walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, we 
you know, we, we see here um, that uh, there are three things in this passage of Scripture. You may, they may not have jumped off the page to you, but there are three truths that, that God has given to the parents of Israel as they're getting ready to go in the promised land. Uh, and the first one has to do with, um, has to do, uh, that really jumps off, uh, off the pages to you, uh, is about affections. Verse 5, and thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. So God speaks of these affections. Now he's speaking it in the context of the family. It doesn't just apply to the family, but it certainly does apply to the family. And so, so understand this, that part of what happens in a home and part of what happens with parents' interaction with their children is to stir up in the children a love for God. And, and I think sometimes we, we fail at that. You know, I had a lot of people growing up and t- telling me I'm, I'm a second-generation Christian because my parents got saved before I was born, grew up in a Christian home. And and, and I saw second-generation Christians like that just sort of go like, yeah, we, you know, we, 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 uh, we're going to do our own thing. And I, I saw them sort of walk away from God or not have a heart for God. Now, my parents were saved in their 20s, and so they, they'd gotten involved in some things and some sin that just didn't bring happiness to them, and they had a lifestyle that didn't bring them satisfaction. They got saved, and it totally transformed from their life. And so it was easy for them to love God. I mean, they're like... Man, God, you, you believe the change God brought in our life, and he did it, and we love him. And I get saved at five and a half, and I don't see a noticeable change. You know, I'm not, I wasn't like gambling at five and a half, you know, shooting uh, craps in the street corner, you know, and I wasn't uh, robbing liquor stores and, you know, whatever. You know, I, I didn't have all that. There wasn't a big change in my life. It took me a while to realize, no, God transformed my life. I see it. But... But um, they had an easier time loving God than maybe my, uh, you, you know, we, we their kids did, and so, um, so so here as parents, what we want to do and what we're commanded to do and what we need to do is stir affections for Jesus Christ. Now, th- there's two things here I want to point out very quickly. This first one, uh, there's an interesting thought because there's two aspects of that stirring. Uh, of the affections for Jesus Christ. Uh, I know that the term here for Lord is Yahweh, which is God, but there is a reference here in the way that it's written, just like in Genesis 1, that speaks of the Trinity. It says, our God is one Lord, uh, and our God is one Lord. And so uh, the Lord our God's one Lord. The, the, The way that God taught the priorities of the family, first of all, let me just say, he started with God. So he said, listen, you're going to teach some things to your kids. Let's get to the starting point. The starting point of every family should be God. God. And so uh, when we talk about this, we're looking at the Trinity. One of the Hebrew names for God is Elohim. When, it, when you see the uh, I am at the end of that, that Hebrew word, it speaks of plural. So in English, if you had an ES or an S at the end of the word, it's plural. Well, in Hebrew, if you put an I am, it's plural. Like, for instance... The word seraph means angel. Well, what do you think the word seraphim means? Angels. Yeah, it's, it's plural. See, you guys know Hebrew, and you did not even know it. That's, that's all the Hebrew I know that I can teach you. Um, but um, so um, God, it speaks of, this, this speaks of his trinity. His very name speaks of the trinity, Elohim. It's plural. Um, Uh, Let us, Genesis 1, let us make man in our image. All throughout the Old Testament, you see God referred to in the plural like that. So when this says, uh, when we are talking about here, the Lord thy God is, uh, our God is one Lord, um, we are remembering uh, what God said at the Tower of Babel. Uh, Let us, he said, Go to, let us go down and there confound their language. He referred to himself as us, just what his name Elohim means. It's plural. It's one God, three persons. Um, In in Isaiah, uh, also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? All throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the Bible, we see God referred to in the plural. So when he says, start with God, we understand that he's starting with the, 
with, with the Trinity, and that's a blessing to every parent. You know why? Because he's put his Holy Spirit inside of us. So when he says, hey, as you're training children, whether it's in uh, si- you know, city life uh, children's ministry or in your home or as a grandparent or as a teacher or just as an uncle or an aunt, whatever influence that you have over children, realize that the Holy Spirit lives inside of us and aids us in that process. So we're looking at transformed the Holy Spirit-led family. Praise God, one of the hardest things to do in societies uh, is to have a family that honors the Lord because Satan fights against that, but guess what? There's a resource, it's the Holy Spirit. So it starts with God. Uh, Isaiah 6, 3, we sing a song, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. What a beautiful song that is. Have you ever considered that, in, that comes from Isaiah 6 and Holy, Holy, Holy is... It speaks of the Trinity, Uh, holy, holy, holy. There's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Holy, holy, holy. And so uh, stir your affections uh, for God. Stir those affections for Jesus Christ. It certainly starts with the Trinity. We get many examples at Jesus Christ um, baptism. Remember, um, Jesus was there being baptized. The Holy Spirit ascended. Um, or descended uh, like a dove, and then you had God speaking from heaven, saying, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. There in that one, one event, you had God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So, so uh, as we look at this, from our perspective, we understand that God's given us resources. His Holy Spirit is living inside of us to be able to help us and to assist us in these parenting things, because when you try to stir up someone's affections, that takes a lot of thought, a lot of direction, and uh, it takes um, it, 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 it's it's a big issue trying to stir up someone's affections. And so, uh, so, so we see God. It starts with God, but then very quickly he talks about the heart. These words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart. Now, interestingly. Uh, it starts, as we're talking about the parenting here, look at uh, back to De- Deuteronomy chapter 6 and look at verses 1 and 2. Now, these are the commandments, the statutes and the judgments, which the Lord your God commandeth you to teach, that, he, or that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it. When you go over the Jordan River, you're going into the land of Canaan. It's going to be yours. And, 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 and I want you to take certain things with you. That thou mightest fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life, and that thy days may be prolonged. Now, I want to just share something with you that I think may be the most important thing we talk about today and apply to every person here. The fact is that uh, when we talk about the heart, uh, and we look at this in context, the first thing that God said was, again, let me, let me pull it up. He said, these are the commandments, the statutes and the judgment with the Lord your God commanded to teach you that you might do them in the land where you go to possess it. And so it always starts with God and it always starts with teaching God's morality, God's moral law. Uh, that's where it starts. But I'm afraid that we get way out of balance in some Christian homes and some, I think, churches, that's what it's all about. It's about God's law. It's about just teaching God's law. And I love the balance of Galatians or of Deuteronomy 6 because it, it goes beyond that. That's where it starts. It starts with these three words, commands, statutes, uh, statutes and judgments. Uh, a command is an order given to observe or to keep. A statute is a requirement that's describing how we live for God uh, in obedience to him. And then judgments have to do with how we handle situations that come up in life. So you understand God said, listen, I have commands, I have statutes, and I have judgments. And you're supposed to teach those. Um, if we don't teach our kids God's moral law and his commandments, then we're failing to do what he asked us to do. And if that's all we teach them, then we are failing to do what he asked us to do. And so what do we teach the next generation? Let's just put it this way. Let's sum it up. God's ways. We teach them God's ways. Um, How do we teach them? Notice, um, 
Uh, n- notice as we get down, uh, verse 5, and thou shalt love. So verses 1 and 2, the commandments, the statutes, uh, be obedient to them, do them, uh, to the, his judgments. But in verse 5, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul and with all thy might. What do we teach the next generation? God's ways. How do we teach the next generation to be the people of God? We teach them to have an affection for God. And without that, we're, 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 we are um, missing the mark. And sometimes I fear we're, we cause more damage than we are be, being helpful. Matt Chandler, I love this quote, said, because you, do, uh, be, because you do not do by what you understand to be right or wrong, you do by what you love. So, so pause for a moment and listen carefully what I'm going to say. The understanding of God's commandments, statutes, and judgments is not enough to motivate our children to obey him and live for him. Because we don't do what we understand to be right, we do according to what we love. I'll give you a personal example, all right? So New Year's resolutions, right? So many of New Year's resolutions have to do with what? They have to do with um, um, diet and exercise, right? Diet and exercise. And so um, the truth is, we know what it means to eat healthy. You know, we know. I I mean, no one really has to teach us and tell us. We know we shouldn't just, you know, veg out in 2024, sit around, couch potato, and do no exercise and become lethargic. We know that. Um, But the knowing of it isn't enough to motivate us to do what we know to do. None of us. And so do, do, do I do that? Um, do I just go, you know, it's not good to snack after 9, Ray. So, you know, those 4,000 calories you're packing away between 9 p.m. and midnight, just don't do that. You know it's bad for you. No. I don't do what I understand to be right. I do what I love. So you know what I love? Ice cream. You know what I love? Cookies. <laughs> And, and, and so we're motivated more by our love than we are by our knowledge of what's the right thing to do. And so it's a br- brilliant balance here. Um, God says, listen, teach the commandments. But if that's all you do, guess what's going to happen? It's going to be a generation that, does, that sort of walks away from God and does their own thing. But teach them the statutes. Put those on the table. Talk about them. Don't ignore them. And then teach them to have a heart for God. Stir up that affection for God in their lives. And so um, it's not our understanding of right and wrong that motivates our actions. Uh, It's love. And so I ask this question, and it's important for us to ask us, what is our greater love in our life? Because love motivates. Are we teaching our children to love God? I think that, that oftentimes we get out of, it's, it's hard to have a balance. I know that as a parent with kids out of the house now. What we ha- seem to do is we have authoritative, uh, no, authoritarian style, which says, I'm laying down the law. Nobody in my house is going to do that. And it's authoritarian, authoritarian. And, and there's, 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 there's none of the affection. And then you have the other side where it's just affection. And, well, you know, we're just going to let them be creative and do whatever they want. And there's no boundaries put in place. What God's advocating here is this beautiful balance of law and love. Because um, uh, if we're just teaching our children um, the law, we're out of balance. But if we're teaching our children to love God, the law is important uh, and we're to teach about God's moral law, but the purpose of the law isn't motivation. Paul was really great with the law. The purpose of the law is to teach us we need a savior, is to teach us that we're sinful. The law just doesn't motivate, do much to motivate us, and the law just doesn't do much to change and transform our life. But love certainly does. And so what is the greatest love in our life? And, and so let me ask you this question. 
Now, now we're asking this of ourselves, and I think we have to apply this to maybe kids that we influence, but what is what what causes you personally? to worship God? What causes you personally to grow in your love for God? Now, I ask myself this, and, and I'll often ask myself this, and, and sometimes I, I just recognize it in my life, and I think it's all of us should purposefully wonder about this and ask about this. What causes you personally, you, to grow in your love for God? So take a moment and think about that. What causes you to grow in your love for God? Okay, now, fill your life with that. Uh, for me, uh, well, let, don't, don't, you know, not, not even for me. Uh, let, let's just say what, what some of those things could be. And, and the list, we could spend a long time on the list, but let me just spend a moment. Um, sometimes it's being out in nature, right? It's being out in nature and seeing God's creation, and you go, wow, what a God. And you just... You grow in your love for him and your worship for him uh, because nature glorifies him. Uh, it, it, I think for all of us, it would be worship music. I think it would be listening to music that helps our heart to worship him. Uh, I think um, a lot of us would have us say, that friend really helps me to love God. It's just something about their spirit and our, and our relationship. Maybe it's meditating on his promises and you say, there's a particular book in the Bible that I really love in it. And it just causes me to know God and to love him. Maybe it's the book of Psalms. Uh, maybe it's getting up early and spending time with him before this city comes to life. And it's sort of quiet. And, you, and you, um, that, that causes you to grow in a heart of worship and in love with God. I'm just simply saying it's different for all of us. What causes you to grow in your love for God? Fill your life with that. Because we are to love God supremely with all our heart, with all our soul, with all our, our mind. And so the first thing he says here is just stir your affections for Jesus Christ. But, but, um, it, it, but, but he, he takes that a step further and uh, look with us. This, this might be the most intimidating aspect of parenting, what I'm going to say next uh, and what the Bible takes us to. But, but it doesn't have to be the most intimidating part. Teach them the ways of God, we see, uh, and then teach them to love God. Uh, oftentimes, I think this is where we fail as parents. In, it, it's in the area of teaching our kids to love God. Um, it's not as hard as we think. I don't think it's rocket science. Um, it, it's it's um, uh, having gospel conversations with our children, even from a young age, yes. Um, ask questions. Uh, well, I, I talk to my kids and they don't really talk to me. Yeah, be creative and ask questions that uh, elicit a response more than just one word. How was your day at school? That's a good question. Good. That's the answer. You know? So, so you got you to gotta elicit some, some, ask some questions that elicit more than just a one word answer uh, and have these gospel conversations because look at verse seven in our text, Deuteronomy six. And thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children and shalt talk of them when thou sittest in thine house, and when thou walkest by the way, and when thou liest down, and when thou risest up. Um, what does that look like? You know, to stir the affections for our children, to stir their affection for God, uh, it's the mundane, simple things of life. That's not, that's not complicated. He says, he says um, uh, talk of them, teach them diligently, teach them about God, teach them a love for God when you... Sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up. That's not complicated. God knows that we are not complicated people. We're very simple people. And so he goes like, hey, you can do this, and this is simple, and every one of us can do this. So what does that look like to stir our affection for God? I think sometimes it's something as simple as sitting down for a meal and taking out maybe food. Maybe there's apple. And uh, kids are, you know, intrigued. You cut that apple in half and you look at the inside of that apple and there's seeds in the middle and every one of them looks the same and it came from a tree. And you look at that and say, isn't God's design amazing? He created this fruit because he wants us to enjoy it. Aren't we glad God loves us that much? And he gave us this and it's sweet and it tastes good. And, and uh, isn't it amazing how God designed this? And, and, then, and then if you're really smart, you put peanut butter on your apple. How many of you love peanut butter on your apple? Come on, all four of us. And, uh, and, 
And uh, that peanut, you know, and you go, man, God, and God even created this peanut. Look what a peanut looks like. And it's unbelievable. God put it there and then they squish it and they process it and we get peanut butter. Glory to God, you know? And, and so um, we, it, it's sometimes it's, it's as simple as that, looking at a piece of fruit and going, you know, God designed that and he loves you and he loves us and he gave us that. Man, we sure do love God. Let's just stop now and thank him and pray and just thank him for that. It, it's, it's not as hard as it says. Because so, so he said, hey, when you sit down, when you get up, when you go to bed, when you're walking along the way, um, What does it look like to help engender? It's spontaneous, it's natural, it's organic. And I'm going to be honest with you. I think those conversations go a lot further, listen, than sitting down and saying, okay, kids, it's, uh, you know, it's right before bedtime. Get your Bibles out. We're going to read our Bible. I'm not against that at all. Um, I think it's good and healthy and right, and we should do that in the home. But but um, and, and let's, let's read the Bible, and then let's talk, talk a bit a little bit, and then, and then you go to bed. Uh, I, I think w- w- what, what Deuteronomy here is saying is it make it organic. Uh, integrate the Bible into your life, and then it's not just a book. It's linked to a God who they, wants to have a personal relationship and has filled their world with good things and great things that then engenders love for them. You know, kids love it when you give them a gift, Right? I mean, they, they love you. Hey, kids, you know what God did for you? You know what he, he you know, look at that flower. It, it's, it's as simple as walking in the way and looking up at the night sky and going, wow, isn't it amazing? That star is going to be in that same spot, uh, except for just a few seconds is going to be a little bit off tomorrow because God's a God of order. And isn't that a beautiful sky? And God put it there that we would enjoy it. Uh, walking, by the way, just simple things. I had some fun with uh, my grandkids this, this last week. Um, <clears throat> and somehow we got onto, uh, I found a video of a mongoose. Good night. I have never, I didn't know anything about mongooses. And it shows them, uh, you know, attacking uh, cobras. And then it sees them. There's a nursery rock and the way they take care of their young and the way they hunt. And I'm like, man, kids, didn't God isn't God amazing and creative that he puts something like a mongoose on this earth? Isn't he amazing and creative? And isn't it fun to learn about God's creation? It's just not rocket science. So he said, he said, teach them, tell them about God. That's where it starts. There's a God who, who put us here and there's a God that we'll answer to one day, but let's talk about his love and, and let's engender that love uh, in, in their heart. And then, and then notice, um, I, I mean, Bedtime is a great time to help kids have a heart for God. And he says that here. He says, you know, when you lie down. And, and so what, what is it and what time? And are we taking advantage of it? Because some parents only talk about God at church or devotional time. And we're great about compartmentalizing our life. But I find what engenders love in a child's heart is when it's just a natural, organic part of our life. We just talk about God. We talk about his goodness. Yeah, we talk about his commands and his statutes and his judgments, but we talk about he's good and we engender that love. And so it goes on to say um, this, um, that that you, you, um, uh, verse eight, notice verse eight, thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand and they shall be as frontlets between thine eyes. Binding what? Well, in verse six, the words that I command you, so, so bind them. And, and, and our Jewish friends uh, have taken that very seriously, uh, it, it, which I don't think is a bad thing. Um, but, but notice what's affected. The eyes, frontlets between the eyes, and on the hands. These are places that I think are symbolic. And I, I'm not saying they're not more than symbolic, but they're definitely symbolic having to do with the eyes, uh, having to do with the hands, uh, stirring our affection for, for, for God. We ought to see life and help our children see life through the eyes of God and through the eyes of God's word. Um, how do we treat our neighbors? How do we treat our friends at school? How do we treat our brother or sister? Uh, what does God say about that? Um, how do we, uh, you know, wh- why is it uh, important to clean up the room or be helpful to at school or, or uh, uh, help mom or, or, and dad around the house? Why is it? Because it has to do with our hands, our hands and our eyes. And so, He's teaching them, hey, stimulate God talk. And then, then let me close it very quickly with this. Look at verse, um, 
uh, verse 9, thou shalt write them upon the posts of thy house and on thy gates. This is the natural progression of a family of grace. It starts with, um, it, it starts with teaching them. It's, it starts with God. It starts with um, who he is, his statutes, uh, his commands, his judgments, and not just leaving it there, but, but, but tying that into a heart of affection and engendering that affection for God uh, and, and teaching them how to have an affectionate heart for God. Teach them God's ways. Stir their affections. And then uh, it, this basically, I'm going to call it this, let your light shine. Let your light shine. A city on a hill can't be hid, Jesus said. Why? Because at nighttime, the lights from the city, you can't miss it. It's on a hill. It's above everything. And so we are to be lights for for God uh, in this world. Uh, You see this natural progression that he's leading us through uh, here. Notice that this letting your light shine comes after the heart is stirred for God and teaching has taken place. Because if you get this out of order, it can become externalism. So a mistake in parenting is if we were to simply say, hey, people are watching us and they need to have, we need to have a good testimony uh, for God. So watch what you do. And by the way, if you misbehave, someone's going to tell me. You know, That just it doesn't really motivate kids to, to, to live uh, and, and to do right. It just becomes externalism. Oh, I taught. If someone's looking at me, my parents taught me, then you have to really behave. Uh, if they're not, maybe I can be a little bit sneaky and do my own thing. Uh, notice that this comes very last, uh, that putting them on, uh, write them upon the posts of thy house. That means when people would go by the house, they'd go, oh, there's, a, there's someone who believes in the Bible, in the gates of the city. It has to do with being outside and people from the outside of the home knowing what you believe. And so that natural order is an externalism. And so many times Christians fall into this trap of just having externalism when our heart's not been changed. And so uh, that's a very dangerous uh, process to have and a very dangerous place uh, to, to, to be at in our Christianity. We don't teach children to act like Christians so that others will think good of them. He said, listen, tell them about God, teach them about my ways, engender a heart of love and affection for God, and then you know what's going to happen naturally? They're going to let their light shine. And people around them are going to go, wow, that's, wow, they have a love for God. They, they, they're motivated by something different than others are. And so if we get those out of order, we're simply teaching our children to live like the, the Pharisees. Um, and I think the hardest place to live a, a Christian life the hardest people to live it before is our own family. And the reason for that is because they know us so well and it doesn't do us any good to hide it from. They see us lose our temper. They see us, do, you know, uh, be selfish. They see us have pride in our hearts. But someone else, I want them to think well of me. So I'm going to have this externalism and I'm going to be in front of them on my best behavior. And so it starts in the home, teaching God's ways, engendering an affection from God for God, um, uh, v- viewing life through a worldview, a Christian worldview, through our eyes, looking at it through the lens of the Bible and helping our children to understand that and the things that we do, whether it's our work or being kind to people or doing our schoolwork, we're all going to do this through the lens of God's word, um, teaching them that relational aspect and then comes, you know what's going to happen? Their life will be transformed and that will glorify God. And the New Testament says this, then shall they see your works and glorify your father, which is in heaven. That's the design of good works, not to glorify the kids, not to go like, wow, you are a good parent. (laughs) That has nothing to do with it. It has to do with them, them having a heart for God so they can flourish, so that they can have fruits of righteousness so that God would be glorified, transformed, Um, And it starts with the heart. Father, we we do love you. Lord, we thank you for making so many things explicit in your word. And uh, Lord, I I know that that, um, in this day, it's it's even increasingly more difficult to do what you've asked the children of Israel to do. Uh, It's increasingly more difficult to do what you have by, by association that you're teaching us to do. 
which is to engender the love for God in the hearts of the children. We have the privilege of influencing. But we have a God who is not just a lawgiver. We have a God who is our Father. We have a God who gives us the Holy Spirit. We have a God who is the, the, the Son, Jesus Christ, that lived on this earth and knows what it is to struggle and the struggle of being hungry and not having enough and, and having a schedule and having difficulties and being tired. We have a God who knows that. And so, Lord, may we be spirit-led families, spirit-led Christians that have a genuine heart for you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.